Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. That's quite a welcome. Thank you. So welcome back to the LBJ Presidential Library. We are honored to have you here, Madam Speaker. I want to talk about your new memoir. And by the way, this will, the, the, the art of power will continue to be sold outside after the program. And the speaker was kind enough to sign them. So you're going to want to buy them, not only for you, but for your friends and family. Um, but this is aptly called The Art of Power. And you have been celebrated for the facility with which you use power. LBJ was called the master of the Senate by Robert Caro and others. You are often called the master of the House. Talk about how you use power. You're, you're, um, the, you seem to have an instinctive view of power and how to use it. Where does that come from, Madam Speaker? Well, thank you for your question. Do I call you Mr. President? Yes, <laughs> That's appropriate. I'll take it. Mr. President, and thank you. Thank you, JR, to the dean for his kind introduction, to the Temple family for their support for the students here and for this whole institution. Let us hear for the Temple family. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I say Temple because it's so exciting for me to be here to be here with uh, Lucy Baines and her family. Uh, it is uh, thrilling for me, and I've been here on any number of occasions, sometimes in the audience, sometimes on the stage. But I said the word temple, I'll say it a third time now, a temple where expansion of power and opportunity in our society is enshrined. I've said to you earlier, at the beginning of our country, Thomas Paine said, the times have found us found them to write a declaration so beautiful, the most beautiful statement ever written, declare, declaring independence, but then declaring war, winning a war, writing our documents. But when they wrote the Constitution, that had to be a compromise, and it had many uh, deficiencies. In fact, it had slavery and did not expand the right to vote. But the, they had the wisdom, the vision of our founders to make the Constitution amendable. So over time, we've had an expansion of freedom in our country, whether it was ending slavery, black men having the right to vote, women eventually having the right to vote, so many things over time that sprang from the Constitution, the right of privacy uh, leading to Roe v. Wade and the rest. And that was all. And then we had Lyndon Johnson with the vote, Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Again, enshrined here, so spectacular for our country, making such a, such a big difference. And all of that going in a positive direction of more freedom, more respect for the individuals in our country until the Dobbs decision. But we can go into that later. But right now, just to say, if you wish, it's up to you. I mean, <laughs> but, but it is important to note that democracy, freedom, has always been expanded until recently in our country, and we have to reverse that. But again, thank you for the opportunity, the invitation to be here uh, to talk about power, leadership, and the rest. Um, where did that come from? I don't know, maybe from being a mom. I mean, you know, you have, uh, we have five children, and uh, you have to be a diplomat, you have to be a manager, you have to be a chauffeur, a chef, or so many things. So you know how to multitask, and you know what your goals are, and you know how to get them done. But uh, apart from that, um, I don't know, it just, I mean, maybe just by seeing other, seeing leaders act, you know that if you're going to make a difference, you, you, I, I tell this to young people or, or even people who are young to politics, coming from the kitchen as I did, kitchen to, ca to the Capitol, the, that um, you have to know your why. You know why you are doing this. 
then it makes your mission one that has, can take all the slings and arrows they can send. But I do believe that, um, and you mentioned uh, the author Caro and what he said about, about uh, Lyndon Johnson. One day I saw him at the White House when he got the, a congr the Presidential Medal of right. Freedom. He said, keep on fighting, keep on fighting. <laughs> that was a nice compliment from him. <laughs> so where does it come from? It comes from knowing your why, knowing your purpose, knowing your facts, knowing your strategy, knowing what's in your heart and how you want to help the American people. But it also comes from your values and your vision. So you feel very confident about what the purpose is. When you watch the history and you see the stories of how Lyndon Johnson passed, President Lyndon Johnson passed the first the Civil Rights Act, it was a decision. You make a decision that you're going to get something done and then you get it done as we saw him use power to do that. In my particular case, um, I had to, uh, you've heard of the glass ceiling? <laughs> well, we have a marble ceiling in the Capitol. <laughs> and it was pretty, it was pretty, I never thought they'd have a woman speaker before we'd have a woman president of the United States. Mm. Pretty soon we will. And, uh, <laughs> So um, I never really wanted to run for Congress, but people urged me to then. I never really wanted to run for leadership, and people urged me to, so I did. But as was mentioned, I got sort of tired of losing, so I decided to take matters into my own hands <laughs> politically. Win, when you win, then the path to the gavel is a lot easier. But, the, um, but they would say things like, um, you know, we have a pecking order here. And a lot of these gentlemen have been waiting for jobs to open up so that they could take their turn at that. And uh, you're breaking into the line. <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> we've been waiting. Oh, they've been waiting. I said, well, we've been waiting over 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they would say things like, um, when I decided to run for leadership, they said, this one was my personal favorite. Who said she could run? <laughs> <laughs> oh, OK. Light my fire, why don't you? <laughs> then they'd say, well, why don't you, the women, why don't you write some things down on a paper of what you'd like to see us do, and then we'll do that for you. <laughs> Poor babies. <laughs> Poor babies. But as I said to the young students I spoke to today, it's not about women being better than men. It's that we have to be at the table. And that was our, our, our mission to do that. But I knew when I became speaker and I got that gavel that I had to do what I had to do in a very strong way. And that's uh, just about knowing what your purpose is, what your facts are, what your strategy is, and showing people what's in your heart about why it's important. And then, as, as, as I just keep saying it, you just have to act. You have decided on a per direction. You have built consensus. Then people trust you. Trust is very important in all of this. Mm. And so you act, and then you win. <laughs> The speaker was kind enough earlier today to do a recording of our new PBS series live from the LBJ Library. And Madam Speaker, when we, can, we, we had that conversation, you said your proudest accomplishment is the passage of the Affordable Care Act, as, as JR said, better known as Obamacare. Uh, Donald Trump has talked about repealing that. He talked about it when he was president, and it came, it, it was it narrowly. Uh, uh, came to a, a, a vote to, to defeat it, and John McCain stood up for exactly, put his thumbs down, and, and voted against the repeal of, of, of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but in the recent de presidential debate with Kamala Harris, he talked about concepts of a plan to repeal <laughs> the Affordable Care Act. What would be the ramifications of repealing the Affordable Care Act? Well, first of all, we're not going to let that happen. But let me just say this. Uh, do you believe 
believe that in the vice president should, oh, are we allowed to talk politics here? I don't know. <laughs> Let's just talk civics and current events. In a recent <laughs> debate, the, uh, uh, his running mate said, oh, he saved it. He saved it. Over 60 times, they tried to repeal, the Republicans and the president, tried to, the then president, tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Tried again and again and again. And um, what is interesting, interesting, because he said he had concepts, he hasn't had the faintest idea what the word concept means. <laughs> He's a notion monger, and that's what he does. He mm. puts out notions which aren't, don't even rise to the level of an idea, much less a concept. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, he, uh, when he became president, I, I said to him, see, you, when somebody becomes president, you want them to succeed. They're the president of the United States. How can we be helpful? Where can we find our common ground for the good of the people? So I said to him when uh, I would, I'm saying, I would never say anything or ask you to do anything that is not in your interest. That's what I said to former presidents, whether it would be President Obama, even a Democrat, most former Democratic president to him. So if we could do something about Affordable Care Act that, that takes it in a direction that you like, but is an improvement for people, we, we always know a bill can be better. When we see the execution of it, you learn. So he had absolutely no interest in that. In fact, the, I'm going to use crude language now. You ready for that? <laughs> see, I can't see it because it's really dark, but you can see it. <laughs> he says, Obamacare sucks. He says that. It doesn't suck. It cures. <laughs> it cures. And so when he has certain concepts, but what really gets me is sometimes you see people say, well, he said he has some idea, concepts about it. Make no mistake, he doesn't believe in governance. Uh, he doesn't want to pay for anything. It's fully paid for. And uh, forgive me for indulging on this one because I consider myself responsible, not in passing it because everybody did that, but in, um, and, and saving it. And uh, he, I mean, nothing that we can do, that we do in Congress now. See, then when LBJ was there, it was a little bit more, uh, shall we say, in house. Now our internal maneuverings are very important, but the outside mobilization is very important. It was important then. The civil rights movement made a difference in what happened in the Congress and in our, of the United States and in our country. John Lewis, being seeing John Lewis up there, such a thrill. I served with him for over 30 years in Congress. My brother, so beautiful. But so outside makes a big difference. And out, the outside, they, the, the Affordable Care Act became more popular, more popular, more popular as people availed themselves to it and distance, were distanced from some of the falsehoods that we'll be putting out there. So that's what they found out, that it, it, it wasn't what they tried at once. They, they, they couldn't even get the votes a lot of times. But in any event, not to go. I, I told um, the others today, when we, when we were on the verge, now it's 100 years it took for us to get to this place. Presidents, since Teddy Roosevelt, let the record show I quoted a Republican president, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt started this, and then Franklin Roosevelt, and, and with Social Security, wanted to do health care, but it wasn't possible. Truman tried, but Medicare was his big thing. And the first person to succeed was Lyndon Johnson with Medicare and Medicaid and all that went with it. But it still wasn't health care for all Americans. And, but that was a giant step forward. And so then, as you know, other presidents, uh, Clintons and all the rest. So it was our turn. We knew that this was an opportunity of a generation. Our president, Barack Obama, was committed to this. He was our inspiration, and he was knowledgeable about it. He was terrific. And we were going to make this happen. But as you know, in the Senate, you need 60 votes. Uh, don't even let me go into that. But anyway, <laughs> 60 votes. That's not in the Constitution, but anyway. Uh, and so when Ted Kennedy passed away and a Republican took his place, 
um, I forget his name, but in any event, when he took his place, <laughs> he, um, the press said to me, it's over for you. In their nice, gentle way, it's over for you. There's no way you're going to get this passed. I said, no, we will. Now it's the fourth time I'm saying it. An opportunity of a generation, we're not letting it pass. We're not letting anything stand in our way. If there's an obstacle there, we'll push open the gate. If that doesn't work, we'll climb the fence. If that doesn't work, we'll pole vault in. And if that doesn't work, we'll helicopter in. But we're not letting anything stand in the way. So one thing and another, we get the bill passed. And they said, which one did you do? I said, we just pushed open that gate because the members had the courage to make the votes. And the um, outside mobilization was so important to us. Thank God for the nuns, because we had to contend with the bishops. <laughs> and the nuns were wonderful, and they were supportive all along in passing and saving it. Thank God for all the patient groups. All the patient groups came together to, because they understood what it meant not to have discrimination on the basis of pre-existing condition, the rest of that. But anyway, we pushed open the gate. And now it just it, it grows. So when he says he has concepts, <laughs> doesn't that involve a thought process or something like that? <laughs> so, I'm just talking civics here. I'm not. <laughs> One of the wonderful sections of your book is titled uh, that our flag is still there, which is one of your favorite lyrics from our, right. our national anthem. And actually, Madam Speaker, is the reason for the flag that you see behind us tonight. The flag is still there. In that section, you talk about the harrowing experience you and your staff had on January 6, 2021. Can you tell us briefly what you were experiencing on that day? Thank you for having the beautiful flag there. I'm from Baltimore originally, and the, my father actually served with Lyndon Johnson in the Congress. Uh, so we've learned about him in our childhood and then, and then of course, growing up. The, and in the national anthem, I know at the games you all land the free home of the Braves. <laughs> but I, <laughs> when it says, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. I see that as the night that we're in, we could be in now. This night that we have to prove that our democracy is intact, that our flag is still there as we pledge each day with liberty and justice for all. Liberty and justice for all, that's what Lyndon Johnson was about. That's what all of our presidents have been about until In any event, in any event, until the, the one that uh, incited an insurrection on the capital of the United States, imagine, and incited an insurrection on the capital of the United States, sent thugs there to do harm, to cause violence and the rest, to insult the people who keep the capital lovely for us to visit, to threaten the uh, poli uh, law enforcement who were there, over 100 of them injured, a few died as a result of that, more than a few. And, um, and to threaten, with a gallows, the vice president of the United States, come after me for a bullet in the head, which they describe in very graphic terms, where is Nancy, where is Nancy, where is Nancy. But the vice president and I have very adequate protection. It's the other members, it's the, the press who's there, the members, the visitors who are there. My own grandchildren were there to see the witness, the historic transfer of power, peaceful transfer of power. Well, it didn't happen that way. But, the, um, but what I'll never forgive them for, two things. One is our staff, these idealistic young people come to Washington to learn more about government to make their contribution because the future belongs to them. To have them have to be hiding under tables, behind locked doors with furniture pushed up a wall without talking for hours because these people were banging on the doors. They were coming to get them. And to come from the undisclosed location and see the trauma in the eyes of so many of the young staff who were there, it was really 
in my view, unforgivable. Almost as on a par with that, though, was that with all that had happened, the threats, the violence, the taking over the Capitol, the defecation on the floor, to be, just to be clear about what happened, that overwhelmingly the Republicans voted against accepting the um, Electoral College vote. Uh, fortunately, I had the gavel, and we had the majority, so we could vote that in. And the Senate did not have that kind of, theirs was more, uh, more unified than, than the House. But, um, but in any event, it is, that's why it's absolutely essential that Hakeem Jeffries has the gavel on January 6th. The Monday. And, and yet, Madam Speaker, uh, just over three years after January 6th, the Republican Party nominates Donald Trump once again as their standard bearer. How do you explain the staying power of Donald Trump? The, 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 the continued appeal among a wide swath of Americans uh, around Donald Trump, this cult of personality. Well, let me first say I think that the, part, the country needs a strong Republican Party. I think it's essential, as was said in our introductions, two part, at least two parties. Strong Republican Party has made such great contributions to our country, great leaders. John McCain, you mentioned, Mitt Romney, two, two presidents from Texas, both named Bush, and um, uh, Bob Dole, et, et cetera, making great contributions to our country. And all of a sudden, it's become like a cult. So I would be the last person to ask, what is the appeal of? <laughs> I can't figure that out. But I do. <laughs> I do understand the American people, and I, I think that there, there is a group, he didn't invent it, but he normalized it and he grew it, that is anti, you know, anti-newcomer, anti-women, anti-LBGQ, anti-diversity and the rest of that, and that's who they are. Uh, there are some very, very wealthy people in our country who just don't want to pay their fair share of taxes there are not as many at the polls, but their money is at the polls, and that's what funds a lot, keeps that going. And then, but then there are legitimate concerns that people have in our country because, um, because the world is changing. They're concerned about innovation. They're concerned about globalization. They see job, jobs threatened, if not lost. There is a factory down the road. It's now in another country. I used to, we also drive trucks and now they're gonna have driverless trucks and this or that. So how does our family and our, our family and our future generations of family fit into all of this? And those are legitimate concerns that must be respected. A, a bill of goods that he sells has not so, done anything about that. But what we did under leadership of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris with the House and Senate Democrats practically without any Republican votes, just a few here and there, sometimes none, was to have an agenda that was for the people. That is to say, kids who didn't want to go to college or who wanted to do the trades and this or that could make good living following their passion and what they wanted to do. And, to, and then in addition to that, to open up, when we did the CHIPS Act, to open it up to more education, more STEM, so that more people, women, minorities, and, and just people who hadn't been exposed to it before could participate in a major way. We could have the benefit of their thinking. There was uh, the, uh, well, the, the rescue package, we didn't have one Republican vote, but we did have a number of things in there that benefited everyone. Child, uh, Biden child tax credit, issues that related to Pensions for Teamsters, we would never know it to hear them talk, but that's what we'd save them, uh, <laughs> over a million uh, um, pensions there. But um, all the things that address the concerns of working families, the people who make our communities run, whether it's police, fire, transportation, all of the um, uh, aspects of daily life that need to be paid for 
were supported in that legislation because that was just at the at the end of COVID. And then we, with the infrastructure package, we had 13 Republican votes. That means, I means um, like 100, 200 of them voted against it. But we call it bipartisan because we're proud that we have 13 Republicans. But all the jobs created there to to um, build the infrastructure of America with jobs that are good paying jobs for working people in every aspect. And then the chips I mentioned and PACT Act for our veterans who are exposed to burn pits. And, uh, and then the IRA, which lowered the cost of prescription drugs as it tries to create good paying jobs for everyone to um, uh, uh, and save the planet at the same time. That they don't, uh, they don't believe in science and they don't believe in governance. So if science says this is happening, see the storm, see the fire, see this, that, and the other thing. Science is saying we ha Congress must act. Government must act. They don't believe in science and they don't believe in governance. And so right now they're saying we should do away with the weather department because they're exaggerating the climate crisis. <laughs> So we have a difference of opinion here. But it doesn't mean all Republicans think that way, just the ones in Congress. And what's, it, <laughs> and what, and what's his name? And what's his name? I want to tell you one thing. <laughs> this, one, this one really is fascinating to me. As a practicing Catholic, excommunicated by my, from my bishop, but that's more his problem than mine, because <laughs> I can still receive. But nonetheless. I say to him, I have five children in six years and seven days. I know the program, OK? <laughs> but that doesn't mean the program's for everybody. And let them decide their own program. But don't go with that. But nonetheless, <clears throat> we, and when, when Dobbs, I didn't say this to you before, when Dobbs' decision was passed, it was terrible. I mean, it was terrible, OK? so. We passed immediately Roe v. Wade. Democrats voted for it, the Republicans not won. OK, but that's what they believe. OK, I respect that. All right. Then we put on the floor, I said to the members, we're going to put on the floor a bill that says women have a right to contraception. Why aren't you doing that? They're going to look good. They're going to make them look like they care about women. I know this place, OK? <laughs> How many Republicans do you think voted for women to have a right to contraception? Eight. 194 voted no. Two abstained. Eight. Eight voted yet. Yeah, eight Republicans. So if, does that tell you what we're dealing with on a daily basis? Now, if you don't think women have a right to contraception, they're your guys. That's just the way it is. So it's, it's really sad because that's freedom. That's about democracy for women and families to make their own decisions about the size, timing, and if they're having a family. That's an economic issue for families. It's a kitchen table issue. Eight. Democracy is also under siege abroad. And you write in the book about a secret meeting you had with Vladimir Zelensky shortly after the Russian invasion. Why, Madam Speaker, is it important to continue to support Ukraine uh, in the face of Russian invasion? I thought I, I had my pin on in my earlier suit, yes. Uh, the fight for d democracy in Ukraine is a fight for democracy writ large. Here is a country whose borders have been violated in, uh, by um, uh, the Russians. The rule of law just, well, threatened a number of places. But let's just talk about Ukraine for now. And um, we, we, the Ukrainian people, they thought they would come in, rose petals, they'd have Kiev, Kiev in a week or something. It didn't happen. But uh, the, Trump wants to have, does not want a democracy at his doorstep. He doesn't want people seeing people living free and enjoying that. And that's what the Russians were seeing. But um, if the the... NATO countries, Poland, et cetera, right adjacent to Ukraine, know how important it is for, for the 
democracy to, democracy to prevail in Ukraine. The non-Moldova, all the other countries who are not yet in NATO know that they're next if, the, if he uh, prevails in Ukraine. So this is, this is the, the courage of, I, I was the first person of, uh, uh, how can I say this, about of highest stature that went uh, to yeah. Ukraine right shortly after the invasion. And to see, the, well, I thought we were going to die. I really thought we were going to die. So dangerous. And I thought, well, we're dying for democracy. That's just the way it is. We're dying for democracy. But we, um, we didn't die. But, <laughs> but it is important to see how dangerous it was there. And the courage that they have is so very remarkable. And we just had the president again, President Zelensky, like the day before we adjourned for, for uh, October in the Capitol again, talking about a path to victory that he has, he has outlined. The, what you should know is, I talked about the eight. There is also another, I don't know the exact number, but there is a Putin clique in the Republican Party in the Congress of the United States. They're there, Putin, all the way. And during all this, did you see the new book that came out today that said that the president, uh, Trump was sent, I used his name, I barely ever say it, but he sent um, COVID tests to Putin over time. Madam so Speaker, let me, let me, may I quote him? So, so this is an article by Peter Baker in the Washington Post about a Bob Woodward book, a, 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 the latest Bob Woodward book which talks about the close relationship that Donald Trump has with Vladimir Putin and had while he was in office. And you're referring to uh, a test, a much coveted uh, COVID test, uh, which we were in desperate need of here in the United States that, that Donald Trump sent to Vladimir Putin. And Putin sent back a message that said, I don't want you to talk to anybody about this because people will get mad at you not me. He knew that it would be p politically disadvantageous to Trump to reveal that he had set this trap. What is your response to that? Well, the, it, as you understand, this was at the same time as he was saying to Congress, don't send money to, don't send support to Ukraine. So it's like, what is, it? you know, I don't know if you've seen this picture. I'm doing this to him. I, there's a picture of the, of the not the cat, was a, Roosevelt Room, but it's all the, uh, you know, his cabinet and this or that, and some of the Democratic leadership and Republican leadership. Once I just got up and I said, I'm leaving this meeting because with you, Mr. President, all roads lead to Putin. And I'm not listening to that anymore. So that's, that, um, that's what it was about. I mean, mm. we don't know what it is. I think maybe it's because Putin is shorter than he is and he likes being around <laughs> shorter people. I just don't know what it is. But there's something there that is not healthy for democracy. And what Putin's goal is, is not just to take over Ukraine, but to make democracy look bad. That's why they interfered in our election in 2016. Accomplice to or if it was Facebook, was an accomplice to it. Oh, we didn't know it was Russian. Well, they paid in rubles, so what, what do you think it was? <laughs> but but um, so they want democracy to look bad, and that's what this is about, is a fight globally between autocracy and democracy, and we must make sure that democracy prevails. And, and that's just what it's about. <laughs> and that fight is what's happening in Ukraine, that manifestation, but it's happening in other ways of uh, infiltrating uh, with money, resources, disinformation, and the rest on the part of Putin right now as we sit here. Yes. Uh, yesterday marked the year anniversary of the attack of Gaza on Israel, which sparked the Israel-Gaza war. Since then, we have seen the death of over 40,000 Palestinians and the displacement of two million more. Is our policy toward the Israel-Gaza war the right policy, Madam Speaker? Well, let me just say, because yesterday was, can you believe it's a year already since that happened? Remembering that it was an assault 
on Israel by a terrorist organization whose purpose is the destruction of the state of Israel. What is it, 1,400 people were killed, a couple hundred uh, kidnapped, some, a few of them Americans. So it was a terrible thing. And Israel, and we all agree, Israel has a right, oh, we all agree, I mean, in government we do, that Israel has a right uh, to, to, to defend itself. War as a resolution of conflict should be eliminated from our, from our uh, possibilities list. It's just that 40,000 40, people, if, if that's the number, but it's a, a big number, people have died, many of them children, many of them civilians. We don't know how many are combatants or how many are children and the rest, but that's just not, just not civilized. It's outside the circle of civilized behavior. And now we have what's happening in um, Lebanon. Still, Israel has a right uh, to protect and defend itself. But we do have to come longer picture with a two-state solution where the Palestinian people can live in peace and, and have uh, security, and Israel can be a secure state. It's unfortunate we did not get to that place. But it's but again, it, look, I've had these people outside my house forever and ever, and they were all criticizing Joe Biden, genocide Joe, they were saying. No, Joe, we were trying to get help to the um, Palestinians. And when we would go to the Republicans, they'd say, well, we'll give you money for humanitarian assistance as long as it doesn't go to the Palestinians. So there's a real hard line there. It, it just, it's most unfortunate. I'm not a big fan of Netanyahu. I don't think he could have done a worse job in terms of defending <clears throat> the country. But we cannot have that, that kind of assault on life. Iran backs Gaza, uh, and they're a threat not only to Israel, but to the United States. How should we view Iran in the world? Well, you have to understand, Israel is on the front line in terms of Iran, in terms of proximity. But Iran is a threat to us all. There's just no question. And I salute President Obama for his masterful, virtuoso uh, accomplishment in the Ukraine agree a nuclear agreement. It was stopping the enrichment of uranium uh, that, would, that takes you to the next step to develop a nuclear weapon. It was masterful in that everybody agreed the Chinese and the Russians, who never wanted to do anything that the Iranians didn't like because they didn't want the Iranians um, financially or in any other way supporting extremists, in, whether it was, um, uh, in Russia's case, the um, Chechens, or in China's case, the, uh, any of the other Muslim populations in China. But they agreed that Iran should not be developing a weapon of mass uh, a, a nuclear weapon. It was masterful that all these countries came together and they agreed, not Israel. Israel did not agree, and that may be one of the reasons and was Netanyahu did not agree. So when What's-His-Name became president, he undid that, and now Iran is way down the road in the enrichment of uranium. This is a, t a terrible thing. I will say as an aside, this um, uh, program, uh, it's, I don't know, initiative, I would say, not program, in Iran was not, uh, strictly speaking, indigenous to begin with. A lot of the technology that they received was from China. A lot of the scientists to put it together were from China. A lot of the delivery system that um, they would need was from China. And if you want to launch a nuclear weapon, you have to have four things. The technology, the scientific knowledge to weaponize it, the delivery system, and the intent. The intent was the only thing from the start, if in fact they had the intent, that would be indigenous. And so uh, there's a lot of bad stuff going around with um, autocratic, uh, autocratic uh, governments. So it, they must be stopped 
but the best way to have stopped him was diplomatically. Mm. When, and they asked me on a show the other day, do you support China, Israel going in and bombing out the nuclear facilities of Iran? No, I mean, first of all, it ain't my decision, but no, I'm not, I, I would like to see a diplomatic solution. What do, you, what do you consider the greatest trouble spot? What, what do you consider our greatest immediate threat in the world? The greatest. <laughs> How about the five greatest? <laughs> um, North Korea is a terrible threat mm. because they're just, I'm one of the only people. I'm putting up the self-serving sign now. Perhaps I should have done it sooner on some things, but right now I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the only people in, in Congress who's been to North Korea. I'm not talking to the border. I'm talking Pyongyang mm. to visit there. And it is such a desperate place. I mean, people are hungry. They, everything goes to, to their, uh, I don't want to say their security, their, their uh, nuclear program. The president is terrible and, and really horrible. We thought we had a better chance. When I was there, we thought we had a better chance with his father. But then the father died, and, and here we are. So North Korea is a threat. They're a threat because they're developing this weaponry. But not only that, they're proliferators. Mm. When I was there, we said, we need you. We really were going to help with the MIAs, the mission in action. There's still some possibilities of getting uh, information or, or remains. Uh, we were talking about their um, weapon that they were developing, said, we're just developing, we'll sell them to if you want to buy them, but that's what we're doing. So they're proliferators. When they do their dog and pony show with a thing, they're not only just doing it to scare people, they're doing it to sell stuff. Uh, they're, they're terrible. Uh, the Chinese um, um, in the South China Sea and the threats that they are, but more importantly, the support they're giving um, Russia into, uh, into uh, Ukraine and Russia, of course, is always a big threat. Uh, the, the control that they hover over communication in their own country, that people just, and if they do know and they talk about it, they, uh, they're immediately uh, incarcerated. Uh, the, uh, what, what, what would you suggest? We got North Korea, we got China, we got Russia, we have- um, Iran and Russia, among others. <laughs> Well, they're not unconnected, you understand. They're not unconnected. Now, what we ha what the part of the issue is, is that Russia and China have used money to go into Latin America, to Africa and the rest, and buy political support. And um, they've been doing it for a long time. So it's very hard to get a vote at the UN sometimes. It doesn't have a massive number of, of um, object, or just people don't even vote because they don't want to take sides, but they should be voting with us on some of these scores that are directly beneficial uh, to them. But the issue of security is, is everything. When, when we would travel, when I would send delegations one thing or another, but it happens all the time before and since me, our purpose is security, the security of America. What is in our interest, in our national security interest? So that's our purpose. You have to know what's happening in all of these countries, what the um, uh, flirtations and the infatuations with other things that are, might be tempting them to go a certain direction or what. That's one. The next is um, economics. What are our economic interests? How are our economic interests served? and how we put security first, but then our economic interest. And third is governance. How do they govern? Is it, is it an honest place where we could invest, tell Americans to invest there because it would help uh, their, the economy and, and help our relationship if it's, not, if it's corrupt? But apart from corrupt, how do they treat their people? So security, economics, and governance. And when you're dealing with Russia, China, North Korea, places like that, Iran, uh, you have nothing in common in terms of any of those priorities. 
of of the um, of of the, our national our national security. We, I mean, America. Uh, I had the privilege of going a number of times on D-Day. Uh, now it's a couple of three months, four months ago. Uh, D-Day. Uh, just think of what happened when the Allies came together and and won World War II, and the organizations that they put together since then to keep the peace. Primary among those, NATO as the security alliance. And President Biden was so masterful, too, of bringing, uh, strengthening NATO, but also increasing its size with Finland and, and um, Sweden becoming members of NATO. It's a very big deal because they have proximity. I mean, Finland has like seven, 800 mile border with Russia. And for them to have the courage to say, no, our security interest lies with NATO. The, the former uh, president has no respect for NATO. He said he wouldn't even honor the, um, wouldn't even honor the article that, of mutual security. If you're struck, struck we're with you when they came to our defense and joined us after 9-11, we don't share that view anymore. And what he said to his friend Putin, if, you, um, if these countries don't pay enough money in their national security, have at them. Have at them. Hmm. So again, um, it's all a decision. Everything's a decision. Elections are decisions. Security is a decision. The economy is a decision. It's all a decision. But it also has to have a vision and values that are in furtherance of making the decision and making every decision in favor of, of prevailing. And that's what we've done in a bipartisan way, especially on security and economic issues. And I work even to this day a great deal with Republicans on governance issues in, the, in those mm -hmm. countries. We, we, we traveled there together. We, we, um, I mean, I went to Taiwan. They went to Taiwan. They, you know, we, we, they, they have been so good on that, and many of them um, advocate for it in the community and the rest and speak for our country when we go overseas. But the nominee of their party has not um, shown the same allegiance to our alliances, whether it's the transatlantic or whatever. And that's a dangerous thing. Uh, that's a dangerous thing for our country. President Biden's opting not to seek re-election uh, is viewed as a, a, a great act of political courage. Can you take us inside the tent? What, what did the process <laughs> look like by which you wielded influence to get him to step aside and pass the torch? I agree with you. It was a very courageous decision on the part of the president. It was patriotic, selfless, and courageous, and I salute him for that. It was his decision to do that, and again, I salute him for that. Uh, it is, as I said, you make every decision in favor of winning the election if so much is at stake. As I said to you before, earlier, John McCain, Mitt Romney, Bob Dole, Bush, Bush, it wasn't a question of life or death for our democracy, but it is now. But it can be now. So, um, so the decision for him not to run was his decision. No. What role did you have <laughs> in influencing him to make that decision? What, what did that look like? Um, you and your fellow leaders in the Democratic Party were clearly wielding influence. What did that look like? Well, this is a historic uh, thing. You no, know, maybe you should ask him. But <laughs> since he's not here, um, no, I would say this. I'm going to say it again. You'll hear this from me forever. Winning an election is a decision. And I did not see us on a path to winning. It had nothing to do actually with the president. It had to do more with his campaign. Here was a president who accomplished so much that he was compared in the same sentence with Lyndon Johnson, 
for what he would only had two years to do it, Lyndon Longer, uh, President Johnson Longer. But in that spirit of accomplishment, goals, knowledge, strategy, get the job done, act, get it done, it was remarkable. That's remarkable. And yet it was at 37% in the polls. What were they not doing? And quite frankly, it was our legacy too, because we took the, what, what, these were acts of Congress, and many of our members had to take tough votes in their districts because it was being misrepresented by the Republicans who weren't voting for these bills as you know, job killer, bill, raise your taxes, increase the national debt. When all he did when he was president of the United States, that was a legislative, we would, he would call accomplishment, was to pass a tax bill that gave 83% of the benefits to the top fraction of 1%. 83% to the top 1%, adding $2 trillion to the national debt, creating nothing in terms of jobs and the rest. Joe Biden created 15, 16 million jobs created under his presidency, private sector playing a very important role, budget investments, uh, fiscal policy to stimulate the economy playing a role. 15, 16 million jobs. This guy, the worst job creation record since Herbert Hoover. Since Herbert Hoover. You know, oh, you know, we have COVID. Yeah, you know, we have COVID where he was in denial and delay, and people died who didn't have to. And when we came in with the rescue package, immediately reversed that money in pockets, shots in arms, children in school, people back to work without one Republican vote. And so, why 37%? I'm getting back to the question. Why 37%? And so, my view it, of it was is that, that there had to be a different way to go forward. That was the president's decision. Mm. He could have stayed, and we would have all been for him to go forward. But the decision for me is that was never going to be in the, cap in the United States, in the White House again. And if you're going to make that decision, you have to make every decision in favor of that happening. President Biden. <laughs> President Biden, pass the torch to your fellow Californian, Kamala Harris, who you've known for two decades. Who, who, tell us about the Kamala Harris that you know. Kamala Harris, I, and I do know her, and the press always likes to put things of, well, they didn't do this together, and they didn't do that. I never did that much with Dianne Feinstein, but she was one of my dearest friends in the world, and I was with her to the end while people were saying she should go. We, we didn't agree. We were pretty far on the spectrum. My on the left, I on the left side, she on the, the right of it. But, and I loved her dearly. But that's because women disagree on policy doesn't mean that we do not have respect. I don't have any disagreements with Kamala on policy. But, Here's who she is. I know her personally. She's a person of deep faith, deep faith. And that is manifested in her concern for people, her why she does all of this for the people. That's personally. Officially, strength, strength. She knows the policy. She knows the strategy. And she is eloquent in her presentation you see it in the Women's Right to Choose. You see it in some other presentation she's making. But she's personally good, officially strong, and politically astute. You don't go from district attorney, district, attorney general, vice president, vice president, Vice President, United States Senate Vice President, and candidate for President of the United States without being politically astute. So she has the capability to not only win, but to have a great Democratic victory for the House and the Senate and governors and the rest of that. But it takes time. It takes time. Campaigns, 
Campaigns are campaigns. It's a war term. It's a war term, a campaign. And so it's a fight. But you have to show your vision, your knowledge, your judgment, your strategy. But show them what's in your heart. And in her heart is great empathy for the American people. I couldn't be prouder. I'm so happy she's out there. And she has really, and I've traveled the country, and she, I see the response she is receiving. But it's hard. You're running for president of the United States. It, it's a, a tall order to get people to know you in those, uh, in those terms. But I feel confident uh, that you'll win. Not, well, you know why? Let me tell you why. Because you now I was party chair, and when I went there, I said, there's no way with this losing stuff we're going to win. And we're we're going to own the ground, own the ground, mobilize, get out every vote. All of you who are making calls, sending postcards, texting, door knocking, all of that, mobilize, own the ground. Second, message. Message with boldness, as progressive as you can be without being menacing. Unifying, <laughs> unifying for the country. We have a responsibility that the flag is still there. Liberty and justice for all, unifying. Now, sometimes I get criticized in my own district in San Francisco for saying that, but as I said, when I was in Michigan at the invitation of the governor there, when I'm, what works in, in Michigan works in San Francisco. What works in San Francisco may not work in Michigan. And Michigan's where we have to win. So, you know, let's, let's win, baby, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and then the third is the money, and she's attracting all that, especially it's beautiful to see the small, the small donors uh, chime in. So no wasted time, no underutilized resources, and no regrets the day after the election that we could have just phoned one more precinct in one more state or something like that. We must win. Everything is on the line. Everything is at stake. I wish it weren't so. I don't want to appear to be a fear monger about it. I'm just telling you the reality of what it is. And um, that's why the decision was made to win this election. And I'm not going to tell you anything. Madam Speaker, you have earned a place in history, not only as the first woman to hold the gavel yeah. in the House of Representatives, but because of the power you've wielded and how you've used that power. How do you wish to be regarded in history? How do I wish to be regarded? Oh. I said to Mr. President earlier today, <laughs> not so fast on that legacy stuff, OK? <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I mean, overwhelmingly by the Affordable Care Act, yes. But um, uh, what I went from housewife, house member, house speaker, was for the children. And it's all about the children for me. So I'd like to be regarded as a champion for children in the Congress. I um, say, I'm about to, did I talk about a Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt? I said him about health care. He made this beautiful presentation, you know, the arena speech. And in the arena speech, he tells us all that you're, once you're in the arena, you're no longer a spectator, right? So what I say to people who want to run for office, especially women, because this is not for the faint of heart. This is, you are, you know, a target once you get in. I, I mean, a political target. I, we happen to be a physical target, sadly, as well. But, but so you're in the arena. You get ready. You're no longer a spectator. You got to be ready to take a punch. You got to be ready to throw a punch for the children. <laughs> <laughs> Since you made me president, I am going to declare that our democracy is stronger because of Nancy Pelosi. Oh. Our flag is still there, and we are very glad that Speaker Nancy Pelosi is here. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you.